Our guest this week on Veterans Chronicles is Fred Clifton Berry Jr., although he goes by Cliff. He is a veteran of both the U.S. Air Force and the U.S. Army. He is a recipient of the Bronze Star for his actions in Vietnam, and he retired from the Army as a lieutenant colonel in 1975. And Cliff, thanks very much for being with us. It is a pleasure, Greg. Let's begin at the beginning. Uh, where were you born and raised? In Neponset, Illinois, born there and then raised in LaSalle, Illinois. And when did you join the service? In, I enlisted in the Air Force in 1948, August 1948. So how old were you when you joined the Air Force? 17. And why did you choose the Air Force? Well, because I wanted to be a radio operator on airplanes. i had been interested in them in radio up in radios and my uncles had served in the Air Force during World War II and so I enlisted for that purpose but the Berlin airlift was going on and so we got sent to Germany instead of radio operator school and what was your role during the Berlin airlift I was a personnel NCO in the 7402nd aircraft control warning group that group controlled the airspace in the uh, U.S. and British zones. And it was at Darmstadt, and when all the airplanes took off from Wiesbaden or Frankfurt, they came over Darmstadt before they then got into one of the corridors to fly into Berlin. How was that orchestrated? Talk a little bit more about not just your role, but how the communications effort was so critical during the airlift. Well, because there were the planes were going over, there was a radio beacon at Darmstadt, and a plane would go over it every two minutes. There'd be another airplane, and the sky was full of airplanes. And part of the uh, mission was to control them so that when they reached Berlin to land at Tempelhof or another airport, they were in sequence rather than colliding with each other. It was control of all the air traffic in and out of Berlin. Were there any close calls, or was it pretty well organized once you figured out how it ought to be Well, structured? There, there were close calls, but people were in communication, radio communication, but the Soviets were trying to do things, and so occasionally they would cause or knock an airplane down flying over the... Uh, Soviet zone. By shooting at it or by other means? By colliding or knocking it out somehow. How did you counter that? By smooth air traffic control. <laughs> we didn't have fighter planes flying escorts, but it was by having the pattern and the flying. And then if radar was detected Soviet aircraft, then our people could tell the planes flying in or out where they were. What were you thinking in terms of the big picture when you had time to think about it, about how the United States and our allies were helping you know, the people in West Berlin who were surrounded, of course, by the communists? It was thinking of the contrast between our aircraft flying over there in 1943, 44, and 45 dropping bombs and here in 1948 and 1949, they were flying milk, bread, coffee, meat, medical supplies, everything else into the same place. And it was good to see the reaction of the German people, not only in Berlin, which I didn't get to, but in Darmstadt, where the German people there were cooperating with us and were positive. And while this was going on, of course, you don't know for sure how successful it is until the Soviets ended the blockade, but did you get a sense that it was having a major impact? I didn't really know. We knew what we had to do every day and every night, but we, we got feedback from uh, the people who had been in there saying that it was positive, but we didn't know if it would cause the lifting of the blockade. What was your reaction when it was lifted? Great relief, cheering, applause all around. And once you knew what you had achieved, how did you feel? What did you think? I was glad to have been part of it. 
even though it was a personnel NCO, not flying an airplane or not being a radio operator, but being a simple part of it was wonderful to realize. Saving a lot of lives uh, all, all together as a team. You might not have flown the plane or dropped the goods, but no. uh, they couldn't have done it without you. Well, I wasn't doing the control, but I was keeping records of the people who were doing that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so where did you go after that? I qualified for the uh, U.S. Military Academy Preparatory School at Stewart Air Force Base, New York, Newburgh, New York, to uh, compete for uh, entrance into West Point, the Military Academy. And what happened there? I qualified and was accepted in the class of 1944. We entered in July 1950. Talk about your time at West Point, because you were there for a number of years, but ultimately left before graduating. Yeah, I was there three years and then graduated and, I mean, resigned in the last year. But the experience there at West Point was, again, inspiring and definitely instructive. And then bonding with your classmates was wonderful. Why did you leave? I got married, and you're not supposed to be married or have pets, and so I resigned. And then uh, a few months later, my wife and I separated, and I volunteered for the draft to get back to get into the Army. And so then you were drafted, and where did you go from there? Where did they send you? Down to Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. And while there, I re-enlisted and requested 82nd Airborne Division and got sent over there in August 1954. Why the 82nd? Because I wanted to be around airplanes again. <laughs> <laughs> and that was, the, that was the best place for it. And the, we learned about the 82nd in World War I and World War II. And because I re-enlisted, then they assigned me there. You mentioned that you uh, joined the Air Force because of your um, fondness for radios and your fondness for, for flight. Talk a little bit more about that, where, uh, about your, your, your love for the air and, and why that was such a big part of how you tried to direct your military career. Well, my uncles, before World War II, in, about, in 1941, two of my uncles had a Piper J3 Cub, and they had it on one of my other uncle's uh, farm field on a, like a lawn. And I didn't fly in it, but they let me sit in it. And then when they went off to the war, they put the cub in my grandmother's garage, actually a barn. And every time I'd visit her, I'd go sit in the Piper Cub and pretend I was flying. And so that was my built-in desire to fly. Let's move back to the 82nd Airborne now. What was that training like? That was terrific uh, and strict because you had to learn to do things properly to jump out of the airplane and land properly and then perform your mission. And the 82nd had its own jump school and uh, it was excellent. It really won wonderful training. So you knew right away that you had made the right choice? Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, because the the company I was assigned to had non-commissioned officers and officers who'd been in World War II and in Korea, and they were examples for us. And they really encouraged us to learn how to jump so we could jump with them. And they motivated us. Where'd you go after Leonard Wood? Well, Leonard Wood, I then went to Fort Knox just briefly and then to Fort Bragg to the 82nd. Okay. You also took up an interest quite early on in your military career in history, and you've been a author or co-author or editor of a number of books. How early did that start, that interest? That was while I was in the uh, Airborne Department at Fort Benning, Georgia as a captain, and my boss one day came to me and he said, Gary, you have to have an, you have to write an article for Infantry Magazine. We promised them an article about Pathfinders, and I was working on the Pathfinder manual. So I said yes, sir, and uh, drafted the article and took it over there 
to Infantry Magazine. They accepted it, and I got paid $70. This is in 1962. And so that encouraged me to write other articles to, for magazines while I was still on active duty. Pretty good uh, supplement to the income there at that time. Yes, indeed. It was. <laughs> and it was fun. Did you have much experience before that in writing and, and, and composition and that sort of thing? No, no, no none at all except just me memos or reports, things like that. That was the first real article. Did you find out you pretty much had an instinct for it, or is it something that you had to work pretty hard to, to get a good grip on? I had to learn how to do it right. <laughs> to make sentences with action in them instead of blundering along. <laughs> yeah. So after Fort Bragg, you mentioned uh, later uh, Fort Benning, what are some of the other assignments that you had here stateside? Okay, Fort Bragg then, I went to Korea in 1957 to the uh, first battle group of the 32nd Infantry in South Korea at Camp Hovey. And that was another interesting experience because we had, the Korean War had finished the armistice actually four years earlier but again we had plenty of officers and non-commissioned officers who had been in the Korean War to, who taught us to, and learned about that and then I became a company commander there and that was excellent also. You're obviously an officer now as opposed to your time in the Air Force uh, where, right. you, where you were enlisted man. Talk about the difference and the responsibility that you felt for those underneath you. Again, it was learning from both those senior to you and junior to you. You can learn from all of them. Who were some of your mentors along the way? Well, in uh, the 82nd Airborne, it was First Lieutenant Richard D. Reich who was our company commander. Uh, and then when I was commissioned, Master Sergeant Bill Young was my platoon sergeant. I was a platoon leader. My, Bill Young was my platoon sergeant. He would made all four combat jumps in the 82nd in World War II. And then in the 32nd Infantry Alpha Company, First Sergeant Rios was again a mentor as well as an instructor and a, everything else because he'd been in the Battle of San Pietro in Italy as part of the 36th Infantry Division and First Sergeant Rios was just a wonderful example who taught you to keep your soldiers informed, know your mission, understand the terrain, all those things. Cliff, let's take a quick break. We'll be right back with Fred Cliftonberry Jr., veteran of the Berlin Airlift, as well as the Vietnam War. We'll be right back on Veterans Chronicles. Welcome back to Veterans Chronicles on the Radio America Network. I'm Greg Columbus, honored to be joined in studio today by U.S. Air Force and U.S. Army veteran Fred Cliftonberry Jr. Uh, Cliff is a recipient of the Bronze Star for his actions in Vietnam, and we'll talk about that in just a few minutes. Uh, Cliff, we've talked a lot about your career leading up to the onset of hostilities in Vietnam. When was the first time you felt that either the United States or you personally would probably end up there? You mean the first time I might, thought I might be going there? What, what was your reaction when, as you started to see a greater American involvement there? Yeah, wondering when I would be sent there. Right. Because I was infantry, and of course, at, at first we had people I knew who were advisors to the South Vietnamese uh, who'd come back. And then, uh, meanwhile, I was I was uh, command general staff college, and then out at Stanford getting a master's degree. And so, right after that is when I went to Vietnam in February '67. What unit were you with? There I was in the 196th Light Infantry Brigade. It was an independent brigade that uh, really was a, a fine outfit. How many men in that outfit? Well, let's see, three, four battalions, probably about 6,000. 6,000? Three infantry battalions, an artillery battalion, plus all the supporting units. 
How strong was the leadership above you? Terrific. Their Major General, actually Brigadier General Richard T. Knowles, K-N-O-W-L-E-S, was the commander when I arrived there. And uh, he was a splendid leader who concentrated on the mission, but also on his officers and soldiers. What kind of training, if there was any specific training, knowing that you would be heading to Vietnam, were you doing with your men before you left? Well, actually, I, I wasn't in a unit. I was at Stanford, so right. I wasn't doing any training. When I got there, though, the 196 had an orientation program where you learned the basics about what was going on there. What was the general mission of the unit? In the beginning, it was Operation, at that time, Operation Junction City, which was part of the offensive against the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese in that part of uh, South Vietnam, near Tay Ninh. And um, that turned out to be successful. And as it finished, then the major commanders wanted more units up in the north of South Vietnam, so they ordered the 196 to go up to Chu Lai. And we went up, the Air Force airlifted our units up there in an excellent air mobility operation to Chu Lai. And we relieved the Marines who were going farther north and campaigned around Chu Lai and that area. Definitely more asymmetric warfare in Vietnam than in World War II and probably Korea as well. How difficult was that to adjust to? It, you had to adjust your mind. You had to realize that you were fighting day and night. There were, there were hazards everywhere. Even you might go through a village and think, oh, just nice little village, but it could be uh, dangerous for you and you had to be alert all the time and to make sure that you're, everybody in your units were alert. Was that, did that take a long time? Was it something that, that you grasped fairly quickly? How would you describe that? You grasped it fairly quickly. <laughs> <laughs> right. Had no other choice, right? Right, you better grasp it or you might be killed or wounded. You mentioned the air campaign. Vietnam's the first war, of course, where there's major use of helicopters in a combat role, and obviously that would be critical to the type of service you would be doing. Yeah. Um, talk about embracing and, and, and utilizing that type of, of weaponry. Well, that's excellent, an excellent point, Greg, because the Army had developed the air mobility concepts at Fort Benning and other places and then employed them in Vietnam. And no, General Knowles was a pilot and had been a helicopter pilot and had been involved in those concepts. But we learned uh, not only how to get into the helicopters, but how to get out of them on the ground and do the mission. Also, we had learned to coordinate the transport helicopters, then the gunships, and then also the Air Force or Navy or Marine Corps fighter planes that were supporting us. So it was a matter of really coordinating, working together on those missions. And the, all the services really worked together so well. And what type of role did you generally play in that coordination? I was the uh, assistant S3 operations officer of the brigade and then became the S3 operations officer so I, I planned operations, uh, coordinated with the units, assigned missions, that sort of thing for the uh, brigade. So the S3 operations and training also. You're listening to Veterans Chronicles on the Radio America Network. Our guest this week is Cliff Berry, and we'll be right back with more of his story on Veterans Chronicles. Welcome back to Veterans Chronicles on the Radio America Network. I'm Greg Corumbus, honored to be joined in studio today by Cliff Berry, veteran of the United States Air Force and the U.S. Army. He retired as a lieutenant colonel from the Army in 1975. Before the break, we were starting to talk, to talk about your service in Vietnam and the use of, of helicopters as weapons in the 
great coordination necessary to make those operations successful. Helicopters also were a centerpiece of the events of November 23, 1967. That is a date uh, which your actions later resulted in you receiving the Bronze Star with a V um, as a result of your heroism that day. Um, you were on board the command and control helicopter. Uh, explain where you were and what the, the circumstances were. Yeah, I'll give you the background for it. It was Thanksgiving Day, and the day before, our commander had said, okay, tomorrow everybody gets a Thanksgiving dinner. But then we received intelligence during the night that the North Vietnamese had a fortified position not very far from where our other our battalions were. And one of our battalions went there um, under order and realized that this was a very fortified position and very strong. And so we had to commit other units, more units, into the battle. And the Army helicopters and the Air Force fighter planes really supported our troops on the ground, uh, but they had to put up with much stronger resistance, more fire, gunfire from the enemy than we'd been having recent, in the recent days. And so we had all this going on, and I was in the command and control helicopter with, the, with our commander, and uh, we used it to pick up wounded and to bring in ammunition as well as coordinate the actions of the unit. And that was what I was doing was hopping out from time to time and helping wounded aboard or getting ammo out. And then we were flying along and received ground fire from another place and so I was able to return the fire there and slow them down so we, uh, we could continue our mission. Let's break that down a little bit more because as you did these things, obviously it's a precarious situation and you are under fire as well. Walk us through what's going through your mind when you're risking your life to help the wounded aboard. What's going through my mind is how to get that wounded soldier on board so we can go back and take him to our local aid station. The concentration on that and not really thinking about incoming fire because the object was to get the wounded soldier on board. How close could you land to them? Uh, well, within 20 feet, 20 yards close because around the objective there, the ground was fairly flat and open, so you could land almost anywhere. And how did you get to them? Or did you have to crawl? Did you just make a dash for it? How did you do it? Usually it was their comrades or the medic helping them or lifting them. And I'd get off and just help them put the wounded soldier into the helicopter and get back on. They were the ones who were bringing the soldiers to the helicopter. Did the, was the pilot able to land the helicopter in a strategic way that sometimes can put the wounded, put the helicopter between the wounded and the people trying to, sh to shoot at them? Actually, I don't think it don't think it occurred that way. It was rather to get to the land as near the wounded as possible and without worrying about the, the fire because we, we had soldiers, units, and some of our tanks between the enemy and where we landed the helicopter. They were doing that. Were your orders to get them out uh, regardless of the situation, or was it to read the situation and to get them out if you could? The latter, because we, we were having to control things from the helicopter, but it was possible then to land and pick them up and still continue to con talk on the radio and communicate and keep the operation going. Did the helicopter take any fire as it uh, either landed or took off? 
actually, after we took off, we were receiving fire on the helicopter, but it wasn't hit, it wasn't hitting us. You could hear it, and but we were able to find out where or to detect where it was coming from, and, and put machine gun fire from the helicopter onto the from the door gunner onto the enemy position. You also returned. I don't know if it's the exact same area. It may have been to to drop ammunition and other supplies. Correct. Correct. Yes. Yeah, because we, you do not want your soldiers to run out of ammo. Right. And so how harrowing was that? It was just the same sort of thing. Just load it on at our command post, get out there, and the helicopter would land in a place that the commander of the unit would suggest. And they'd either pop a smoke grenade, a colored smoke grenade, or have a panel on the uh, ground, which they consider the best place for the helicopter to land. So again, it's coordination among the various units. Did you have to hop off to deliver, or did they come and get it? Uh, both. Okay. Hop off and help hand it to them so they could run off with it. Yeah. What was your reaction when you found out that you've been put in and were going to receive the Bronze Star? I didn't know about it. Uh, because we had so many people who had done such wonderful things. And w when I found out about it, I was just thankful because I had survived and had taken part in the action and been one of those who had done what we were supposed to do. How long did you stay in Vietnam? I was there, and it was a year, there for a year. I went there in February 67 and left in February 58, just after the well, part of the Tet Offensive was underway. And where did they send you then? Okay, back to Washington, D.C., to the Office of the Chief of Research and Development, Department of the Army, and then the Pentagon. As one of my commanders years earlier had said, eventually, Cliff, you're going to have to go to the Pentagon. <laughs> Everybody ends up there sooner or later. Sooner or huh? later. <laughs> so you came to the nation's capital at a pretty sensitive time during the war and a pretty sensitive time politically. Uh, a lot of protests going on in Washington at the time. Uh, and the treatment, as has been well documented, of returning troops was quite deplorable uh, during that time and, and, and in, the, in the later years as well. Did you experience any of that? No, I didn't. Uh, because we were here and living in Alexandria, Virginia, and serving in the Pentagon and in that area. And the only thing I experienced was when, uh, I think it was in, in April or May of 68, there were demonstrations in Washington, and we had to go down and help put them down. Uh, but that, no, I never experienced bad treatment from people. How would you describe based on your view from the role you had at the Pentagon, um, the cohesion of the military effort. There was obviously a lot of controversy over Westmoreland and so forth, and, and some of the decisions made up even higher here in Washington. So uh, was that talked about, or were you mainly focused on, on your day-to-day -day assignment? More focused on what we were doing at the time, which is our missions everywhere around the world, and you couldn't you, you couldn't let your feelings or your political thoughts influence what you were doing in on your job after the pentagon where did you go well let's see 72 73 I'm trying to think now to korea South Korea, back to South Korea, to uh, the Second Infantry Division at Camp Hovey, the same place I'd been earlier, as commander of oh no from the Pentagon it was 1970 down to uh, Southern Command in the Canal Zone. Southern Command was for all of Central and South America, and we were there three years, and then I went to uh, South Korea. I'm sorry for that mixture. Oh, no problem at all. 
So we're getting pretty close to the end of your active duty career. 1975, you've got 20 years in. Uh, why did you decide to retire then? Well, we'd moved around a lot then, and uh, I had written articles and I'd, uh, in all those years from 62 six, onward, and I'd been in OSD Public Affairs in the Pentagon, and I received an offer to be a co-editor of Armed Forces Journal magazine, and that really appealed to me, so I decided to retire and get into the military magazine business. You've written about so many different things uh, related to the military over the years. Which one do you find yourself most fascinated or most passionate about? I see the, the medics at war is one of the most fascinating. The one that's always with me though is the role of the infantry in our wars because I was an infantryman. Mm -hmm. But the medics always are fascinating and they're always so essential to our survival in performing our mission. America of course now is an all volunteer force. Back then that wasn't the case. So there's a huge percentage of Americans now that don't know what it's like first of all to be in uniform but certainly to be in combat. Uh, as we have watched over the past 16 years, uh, almost uh, consistently, there's been military action in Afghanistan or Iraq. What do you want the American people to know about the people that put their lives on the line? To know that they are Americans also. They are like their family members. They are committed to their mission. They make things happen for the benefit of the rest of us. And if we can remember our veterans, learn about them, I think it will help our society become more cohesive, more unified. An example is the American Battle Monuments Commission We're, with our military cemeteries overseas from World War I and World War II. Learning about the life stories of those who are memorialized or interred there. They're not just white headstones. There's a life there. There's a person there. And our people should know about what our young men and women of the armed services have done, are doing now, and will do in the future. Do you feel like Americans do have that understanding, or do we need to do a better job? I think we need to do a better job of informing them and letting them know. One of the advantages of the draft, as I found serving in that period, was that you had people coming from all over the nation and then coming together, bonding together to do their missions. And that was a good thing. And you learned more about the rest of the country. And you met fine people. Any that stick out to you? I think the first ones were in basic training, Air Force basic training, down at uh, Lackland Air Force Base, learning from people from New York and Connecticut about pizzas. I had no, <laughs> coming out of Northern Illinois, I had no idea what pizza was. You had the deep dish, though, right? Say again? Chicago deep dish. I, I, was, you didn't, you didn't. I was from LaSalle, and ah. we didn't know much about <laughs> Chicago. You had. Illinois, and then you had Chicago. Oh, it's, yeah, it's still <laughs> kind of that way, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> uh, sir, just a couple minutes left in our conversation, really just a minute. Uh, when you think back to your time in both the Air Force and the Army, over 20 years of service on active duty to this country, and then all the work you've done uh, in written form, what are you most proud of? Of having been part of these actions, whether in peace or in combat, on behalf of our country and ser serving with people who are doing the same thing. Cliff, it's been an honor to meet you and we thank you so much for coming in and most of all we thank you for your service to our country. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Greg. It's a privilege.
Thank you, sir. Fred Clifton Berry, Jr. Uh, Cliff, as we call him, is a veteran of both the U.S. Air Force and the U.S. Army. As we mentioned, he is a recipient of the Bronze Star for his actions in Vietnam. He retired from the U.S. Army as a lieutenant colonel in 1975, and he's also a prolific author and editor uh, for military publications. I'm Greg Corumbus. This is Veterans Chronicles.